What are the risks inherent in AI-driven automation in patient care? And how can we ensure the protection of sensitive patient information while maximizing its benefits? What defines AI's snake oil? And how does its presence hinder progress within the medical field? I'm Dr. Kirsten Bibbins-Domingo, Editor-in-Chief of JAMA and the JAMA Network. This conversation is part of a series of videos and podcasts hosted by JAMA in which we explore the issues surrounding the rapidly evolving intersection of AI and medicine. Today, I'm joined by Arvind Narayanan, who is Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University, where he directs the Center for Information Technology Policy. Dr. Narayanan is a recipient of the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and is an expert on information privacy, fairness in machine learning, and the societal impact of digital technologies such as AI. Welcome, Dr. Narayanan. Hi, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Would you mind if we do this interview on a first name basis? Absolutely, please. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Well, Arvind, um, I know you're an expert in uh, AI fairness. Give me an idea of how I should think about what we mean by AI fairness. And if, if you could help put it in the context of AI's applications to medicine. Sure. Thanks, Kirsten. Uh, happy to do that. There was a well-known study in science from a couple of years ago. The first author was Ziad Obermeyer, who looked at Optum's algorithm for risk prediction that many hospitals use in order to target interventions to patients. What they found was that the algorithm had a strong racial bias in the sense that for two patients, who had the same health risks, one white and one black, the algorithm would be much more likely to prioritize the white patient. And what they figured out was the interesting reason why this was happening. The algorithm had been trained to predict health costs and minimize health costs. And like all AI algorithms, it's trained on past data from the system. And since most hospitals had a history of spending more on white patients than on black patients, the algorithm had learned that pattern. It had done what it was supposed to do. And in terms of what it was programmed to do, it was working correctly. It was correctly predicting that by targeting these interventions more to white patients than black patients, hospitals could save more on costs. So this is one kind of bias. It's looking at the structural inequalities that we've had in our health systems, picking up those patterns and using that as the basis for future decision making. In other words, perpetuating past inequalities into the future. So the model it's working, the model and all of the math behind developing these models are working exactly as intended. Um, they're learning from the patterns that exist, but the patterns that exist reflect the inequities that we have in the practice of medicine. In, and, uh, and so the model has just learned those. And the danger here really is that these, these models allow us to magnify these, right? Because if you adopt this across every Optum health system, um, you're magnifying these types of inequities. Equities. Absolutely. Magnify, reify. But when you've automated it, a couple of things have happened. One is you've given it a veneer of impartiality. It's data driven, right? It's math. Uh, it has been validated to work correctly. And the other thing that happens is we're taking those moments of introspection out of the equation. And so it becomes much harder to change it. Interesting. So it's not just the problem of scaling, it's that uh, that uh, we tend to believe things that are math-based and proven. This new technology is probably smarter than I, and, and maybe I would have the discussion with the patient or think twice about this. Um, uh, so yes, yeah, so, so this is a real, real concern. Do you have another example? For sure. A different kind of bias in clinical applications of AI might be more related to the technology itself. Uh, one of the reasons for this could be that there is more data from some populations than others. Minority populations by definition are often going to have uh, fewer data points put into the system. 
And that means that the model might be better at picking up the patterns for the majority population than the minority population. So this data disparity leads in turn to a disparity in the performance of the model for different algorithms. And so this is more of an issue where AI itself is the problem rather than simply perpetuating something that's been going on in the system. And here we can hope for uh, technical solutions that can uh, potentially address those disparities. Good. So I wanted to, to get you to talking about hopefully solutions to, to these problems. So how do we identify first the issues of bias that might be inherent in a model? And then what are the strategies to mitigate against those biases? Yeah, maybe let, let's, uh, let's start with the hard problem, uh, which is when there are existing inequities in the health system. And I think constant monitoring is essential. But of course, that requires researchers uh, clinicians and others to actually do this work, for that work to be rewarded through uh, publications. But assuming all of that happens, we do have a good amount of visibility into these biases that are going on. So I think that's good news. And I think we should capitalize on that. And I think we should be funding this kind of work. We should be rewarding this kind of work. There should be more of these in our journals. And we should do it on an ongoing basis. So one of the challenges with research as a way of bringing this to light is that to uh, be able to publish it, it's often good to have novel findings. And so in the last few years, as the issue of bias has been coming to the fore, it has been possible to publish this work. I worry that the incentives are gradually going away now that people understand how bias is possible. However, if we want to fix it, we need to constantly keep the spotlight on it until the incentives change and until fixes start rolling out. These are not one-off cases. These are, these are uh, the bias is, is uh, sort of inherent to uh, the way these models learn and the biases we know are inherent in the way society is structured. And so we have to have ongoing monitoring, not just you know raising a flag once to say, oh, that's interesting that that happens with AI tools, but uh, we have to be actually monitoring. Do we have access to the types of data um, and, uh, and insight uh, visibility into algorithms to be able to actually monitor? Right, I think that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, to, to the first part of your question, this is very much what we should expect as the default. These aren't one-off cases. Going back to the Optum example, something I found really interesting was that in response to the research, Optum said to the press, this is what the cost model is supposed to do. It's doing what it's supposed to do. And if hospitals are using this instead of using a risk model, it's their fault. Whereas, you know, hospitals would rather put the blame on Optim, right? And so there is this kind of diffusion of responsibility here. Uh, and so the fixes are not going to be easy. That's why it's going to take constant monitoring. I do think access is an issue. There have been cases where problems have only come to light when, after a faulty system was deployed in hundreds of hospitals and many years later, someone in an independent health system was able to use their own patient population and look at the decisions that have been made by the system in order to evaluate its performance. Um, okay, so we talked about the harder one and the solutions for the ones where um, where the data is, we just have asymmetric data availability for some populations, not others. Um, what are the solutions there? Yeah, one a, a solution that's often proposed is to oversample certain populations. In other words, not to pick the same proportion. Uh, let's say, you know, uh, 1% uh, of uh, patients from each population, but instead 1% of patients from one population, but 3% of patients from a smaller population. That would balance out a little bit the disparity in the sample size uh, for each of those populations. Uh, the concern here is that we're now putting more of the burden on minority populations to contribute their data for the building of AI models. And so I think uh, we need to be thinking about different ways of doing this for that contribution to be perhaps valued, con uh, compensated perhaps in different ways than is being today uh, done today. So that's uh, one way of looking at it. Another way of looking at it is, can we use synthetic data? Can we use imputed data? Uh, can we use algorithms that will do a better job of accounting for the disparities in the sample sizes uh, and be able to close the disparities that way? 
Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I want to turn uh, to uh, the, the provocative title that I understand is a book you're working on, AI Snake Oil. Um, tell me a little bit about what you mean by AI Snake Oil, and maybe we can go into that a little bit deeper. Sure. AI Snake Oil is simply AI that does not and cannot work. And I think there's hmm. a lot of it out there. I see. So snake oil, you mean really, uh, um, we're not talking about bias or ways in which the models might be leading us astray, but you're talking about the hype that um, that has accompanied our enthusiasm for AI and that there are people capitalizing, as is often the case, uh, to, That's right. to try to That's sell right. us something to make our life easier, which may not actually work. Exactly. I'm talking about cases where you're going, why does this pro 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 product even exist? Yeah, so let's start with research. And in, in the research world, it's not you know people trying to fool others, but it's often people fooling themselves. Uh, what we've noticed is that uh, you know evaluating AI and machine learning is obviously hard in any field, including in medical AI. And this has led to you know a, a lot of comically flawed research, I would say. Uh, for for instance, when COVID happened there was a big influx of researchers trying to apply their machine learning skills to things like chest radiographs in order to be able to try to detect COVID. And there are well over a thousand papers on this. And there have been systematic studies of these papers to look at the quality of reporting and to, to try to identify errors. There was one study that looked at 62 of these papers, and they had to whittle it down from a bigger set of 400 because most of those 400 papers had such poor reporting standards that they couldn't even be evaluated. So out of these 62, they concluded that zero out of 62 had produced reliable evidence because they fell well short of uh, standards of evaluating and reporting uh, these algorithms in the medical context. Uh, and in particular, the worst of it was 16 studies that had all used a particular kind of flawed data set, where what they had done is all the cases, the positive examples of COVID came from one data source, right? And so they, and to train a machine learning model, they have to have uh, controls, they have to have negative samples that did not come from the same hospital, it came from a different data source. So the positives were cases of uh, COVID positive adults and the negatives came from a different source, which was children uh, who had pneumonia. And what ended up happening was that <laughs> the algorithm was not learning to detect COVID. It was learning to distinguish children from adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And this is a whole bunch of papers, <laughs> um, a whole bunch Very of papers good. that had done this. And, and now by now there are many, many systematic reviews that have looked at entire groups of machine learning for health papers and found these kinds of really basic pitfalls in large uh, fractions of sampled studies over and over again in many subfields of medicine. I want to talk a little bit about uh, generative AI and um, what you see on the horizon. I know there's there's excitement about using generative AI for diagnosis and uh, and thinking of it as a way that engages patients more directly in their self-diagnosis and in engaging more directly in that process. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you see on the horizons as the the potential in this area and as the as well as the potential risks in this area. Absolutely. I have used generative AI for self-diagnosis, but just the difference in convenience between that and, uh, you know, finding the next available appointment with uh, my primary care physician, it's just such a huge gap. Uh, and I think a good start would be just to figure out how many people are doing this, how they're using it, uh, what are the difficulties they're encountering because it's happening and I think it is going to grow quickly for sure. Uh, one way to think about it is just as an alternative to uh, Googling one's symptoms. I think uh, there are, compared to that baseline, there are some clear potential advantages to generative AI tools, which, uh, you know, uh, which can offer uh, a more thorough uh, experience for the patient as well as uh, something that's not a one shot, but instead uh, a more pleasant user interaction, if you will, um, and uh, uh, something that would um, both be potentially more accurate, but also potentially more user-friendly compared to 
uh, using you know, uh, an online symptom checker or Googling or something like that. So that's the opportunity on the one hand, but I think the risks are also equally clear. Uh, we've talked about uh, biases in traditional AI and machine learning tools. There is uh, an analogous set of concerns with generative AI as well. Uh, just a few months ago, there was a paper called AI chatbots are not yet ready for clinical use. And it looked at the kind of biases that can happen when we put uh, the usual kinds of queries into uh, these tools. Uh, so for instance, uh, the query that they had was for a 50 year old white male with certain symptoms, what is the choice of analgesic versus for a 50 year old black male? And there was a difference, for example, in ChatGPT's answers, in one case recommending opioids and in another case recommending aspirin. Uh, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, familiar biases in the health system are being picked up by these tools because of the data that they're trained on. So I think those are the opportunities and the risks. And I think it is uh, it is very exciting, but I think we should tread carefully. And I think a lot more uh, research is uh, necessary before we can have any sort of confidence in them. There's There has been interest in what are the standards for evaluating the accuracy of, of um, chat GPT, uh, for example, you know, should it be that it's just passing the USMLE exam at a certain rate? Should it be that um, it uh, Many hospital systems, as I'm sure you know, are have been interested in offloading the work of physicians by having or clinicians by having uh, one of these chatbots generate the first patient response. So maybe you didn't go to ChatGPT. Maybe you have your primary care provider has uh, access to a patient portal, and you get an automated response back from from something. What do you, What do you think our standards should be? How should we be studying these to figure out what the the right the right uh, when, when they're good use and endorsed by the hospital, for example. Yeah, I, this I think is probably the biggest risk with clinical uses of chatbots, which is that they can quote unquote hallucinate, they can make up facts. And so, you know, they can produce a wrong diagnosis and they can produce uh, dangerous information uh, to patients or when a clinician uses them. Uh, and the reason is simply that the kinds of views that we want in the real world is different from answering USMLE questions. And we can't generalize from one to the other. Medical ex licensing exams obviously have been validated on uh, medical professionals. And we know that when a medical professional has a certain performance on the exam that is based on an underlying set of skills and knowledge that is going to generalize to a certain extent to the real world. And of course, the licensing exam is not the only thing we look at. There's, you know, years of practice and training and various other checks and balances. And none of those exist when you're talking about AI, right? It's just a text generator. And so the way that a text generator does well on a medical licensing exam is uh, such a thin veneer of the way in which a human expert does well on the exam. Uh, and so I think what we really need are evaluations of medical professionals actually using these tools in their day-to-day -day jobs uh, you know, on an experimental basis, and for AI experts to work with medical professionals to evaluate them in those naturalistic settings uh, in actual clinical use. And until we have those kinds of evaluations, I think we should have very little confidence in how these are going to work in the real world. I wonder what you think about how we guard the sensitivity of patient information um, against the value of having better data help us create better tools. Right. Data sensitivity and privacy is one of the biggest tensions in medical uses of AI and uh, machine learning and technology in general. Uh, privacy is obviously hugely important. Uh, it, what I've found in my work is that there has been a lot of emphasis on using uh, technical methods to protect privacy. This is uh, what HIPAA asks for, for instance, you know, remove these 18 identifiers and then you're good to go. Part of the solution at least has to be in terms of our processes, in terms of uh, uh, the care with which we treat this data, rather than this kind of... Uh, transform this data into this de-identified safe form, and then you can put it out there and anyone can do anything they want with it. I think that model is maybe not the right way to think about things. I've done some work with social scientists 
my colleague here at Princeton, Professor Matt Salganik, who was one of the people behind what is called the Fragile Families Challenge. It's uh, a lot of very sensitive data from uh, low-income families, including medical data, including genetic data. Uh, and one of the things that we found is that various uh, straightforward, non-technical ways of protecting privacy can be very, very helpful. Uh, simply asking people to fill out a form, talking about what they're going to use it for, what they've done in the past, uh, can greatly decrease the attack surface. Uh, that's a very different situation compared to here is a de-identified data set. Any company can come and get access to it. They can do whatever they want with it. Or in some cases, even releasing it to the public, which has been done uh, with some sensitive data sets as well. Right. So there's a big distinction between releasing it to a set of trusted researchers based on approved uh, purposes for research, which is a model we're more familiar with in research, versus releasing it to the public, which is more of what the AI community is familiar with. So I think we should resist the mm -hmm. latter model. It is true that that is, has been responsible for a lot of innovation in the AI field, this kind of uh, easy availability of data. But I think to some extent that is really incompatible with privacy and also you know, respecting patient rights in the way that we should. So I think there should be some barriers, there should be uh, some uh, human involvement, perhaps strong human involvement in figuring out who should get access to the data under what conditions, you know, maybe in a restricted environment, it's not, you know, that they get to take it home and do, uh, do whatever with it. So I think we should look to a lot of those kinds of non-technical ways of protecting privacy. Um, how do how should I think about this in the context, for example, of electronic health records, especially given the consolidation of many of these um, types of data sources across health systems by um, by companies and you know uh, those who make electronic health records and things like that? Um, how should I think about that? Sometimes, when they say they're worried about privacy, what they're really objecting to is a certain use of the data. Maybe they're saying, mm -hmm. "I don't want to contribute my data." to these you know, trillion dollar tech companies coming in and training their models, which they're going, then going to use for their purposes. The patient doesn't know for what purposes. There is a long list of companies changing their terms of service or you know, repurposing data or models for other purposes. And so I think we should be careful about those two types of privacy concerns. I think one of those types of privacy concerns can be solved by putting processes and controls in place and legal methods and technical methods. But the other one really just goes to fundamental issues of patient respect. I think if, if they're saying that they don't want their data to be used for certain purposes, I think that's a kind of objection that we should treat differently. I think that's a really good point. It came up, I believe, in the conversations we had with uh, Dr. Nigam Shah from Stanford. He talked about privacy and security, and talked about what patients what patients want. I've, I've heard it when others um, really viewing the solution as um, as enabling patients to opt into certain ways their data would be used, or other types of ways they wouldn't be used. And there's something. Uh, clearly very um, attractive about that. What's your advice for a journal editor like myself, uh, where we want to be able to be open to the innovation that is happening with AI and its applications. We want to not fall into the hype cycle. We want to keep our eye on the standards for why we publish research at all. Um, we know that there's building blocks to research, but ultimately we care about not just because something's cool, but that we actually improve health of patients, right? We care about the outcomes. Um, what, what's your advice about how we could do a better job either setting standards, detecting nonsense? Um, do you have some advice for me? As someone who has a quote unquote AI expert, I wouldn't trust myself to get all of this right. You know, there are really hundreds of little details that you have to be mindful of in the course of building and reporting a machine learning pipeline for a complex data analysis task. So we thought, hey, maybe a checklist can help. And it's not, it's not purely a checklist. It's a, it's a set of guidelines that you have to keep in mind throughout your project. It's not something you do at the end if you've gotten some of the steps wrong. Uh, while building the model, the checklist is not going to help you at the end. And so uh, we called it reporting standards for machine learning-based science. Uh, and it's... Uh, 
as a paper that we have, uh, we've done some preliminary informal tests with uh, people to try to use it for their own machine learning based research. And they have found that it has helped them detect errors that would otherwise have passed unnoticed. Uh, so we hope that that can be helpful. Maybe it can even become a thing that journals ask authors to do when they're submitting a paper. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to checking it out. Uh, and uh, and it does, it does, uh, I, I think um, there's hype and there's ill intent for obviously some people who are trying to sell you the snake oil, but there's just a lot of mistakes, oversight, especially in a field that's moving rapidly uh, that uh, that I think we all have to be able to, to guard against. And that's helpful to both um, well-intentioned authors as well as well-intentioned journals. All right, it's been such a pleasure talking with you, Arvind. Thank you, this was wonderful. Thank you for watching and listening. We welcome comments on this series. We also welcome submissions in response to JAMA's AI and Medicine Call for Papers. Until next time, stay informed and stay inspired. We hope you'll join us for future episodes of the AI and Clinical Practice series, where we will continue to discuss the opportunities and challenges posed by AI. Subscribe to the JAMA Network YouTube channel and follow JAMA Network podcasts, available wherever you get your podcasts.